So our last talk before lunch is going to be presented by Andrew McDonnell, who is going to be talking about reducing bugs with Boost Test. Please make him welcome. All right, thank you very much. Um, we seem to have a bit of a theme going today with software testing, so I'm going to do a quick recap of some software engineering, uh, talk a bit more about unit testing, and then we'll have a look at Boost, which is an open source package that can help you do unit testing in C and C++. So, um, all software has bugs, so you seem to have a bit of a theme going there. Why are we testing? All software has bugs. Um, we don't want to be embarrassed because you want to have people run your software and you don't want it to break on them. If you're working for an employer cutting code, you want to save dollar, you've got to get the job done. Um, you don't want your boss giving you a hard time because your software is not working. And of course, you don't want to be up till 3 a.m. in the morning trying to debug stuff. Um, we all do that from time to time, but I'd rather go to bed and get some sleep than still be there and my wife coming in and sort of, why are you still on the computer at 2 a.m. kind of stuff. Um, and of course, you don't want the software to crash. Um, these days, of course, buses and aeroplanes and things have software in it, so one hopes they test that. So, in the beginning, what can we do? Well, we can um, smoke test, compile it, run it. That tests your development environment, um, the worst bugs and egregious compiles. Not really that useful, though, because, um, well, you're not really doing much, just running, compiling it. Then there's always the um, Apple approach, which you've probably all seen. Um, <laughs> get the users to test it. Well, the users might not be that happy if they're the ones doing all the testing for you. So, try that. So, what can we really do? Well, we can do integration testing, which is where you have the system in a deployed lab environment after it's been packaged, you've installed it. You have a, quite a script to go through, you check out all the features, you make sure it works as a whole. Um, that will find you a lot of bugs, it checks that it does what it does, but it might not fix your edge cases, and there might be subtle bugs that, because you've only got so much time, your test script won't exercise everything. Acceptance testing feature walkthroughs, that's where you sit there with a the customer and they might play with it, and they'll probably have a different script from the developer's unit integration testing. They're looking for that it does, they're looking feel whether the user interface might work as it's supposed to. Managed alpha beta testing, so you'll um, put the software out in the world, you might, like a lot of games companies might have invitation only ones, so you have what you might call your more advanced users. So they're not afraid to find the bugs, they usually know how to report them in a way that's going to help you. Again, that's really a form of integration testing. Then we have unit testing, which is what the rest of this talk's about. And unit testing is where you get down to the innermost parts of your software, individual files, classes, um, API calls, and we try and exercise them in all the paths we can think of using code. Um, and that can catch a lot of the bugs that don't necessarily show up in integration, but then they show up when you ship the software or you put it out there on GitHub and someone downloads the Debian package and that's when it breaks. So, unit testing will save you hacking time, which is important because we all really want to just cut code. You exercise the low-level functions, your class API, like I said. Um, unit test code is maintained in your code base. This I find is really quite important. So it used to be like a lot of people, and I've found this a lot with new developers if I mentor them when they come up, they'll write a test program and they'll throw it away. And it's like, turn it into a unit test, put it in Git or Subversion or somewhere because you want to run it again. Um, regression testing is important. So maintain unit test code with your normal code. Um, if you've got to write the unit test code, it helps you to structure your code. So you might, code's evolutionary, especially when you're developing stuff in an agile way. Um, often when you sit down and write the unit test, you realise you might be able to design your API or your code better so that it um, fits. And of course, unit testing gives us the benefit of being able to repeat and test. That way you know you make a change you run the test again and it shows up sooner than before you go through the whole integration packaging. Oh, it's broken on the end user's computer. So, open coding, that's why we're all here. Um, 
I guess if you've got an open source project, you want to attract developers to come and help you with it. They probably look at it, if they can see that you've got a suite of unit tests, they're probably going to feel a bit more comfortable that um, this is a good project to work with. I can make a change. You can make a, you know, your developers might make a commit. They can run the unit tests and check they haven't broken everyone else's stuff. And of course, if you've got some sort of library or API, well, if I'm looking for an API or a library to help me write a piece of software, if I know the library's being unit tested as well as every other type of test, well, it gives me a degree of confidence. If I need to make a patch to the API for my code, I can rerun the unit tests and make sure I haven't broken anything. I found this quote on the internet. It's anonymous. I can't attribute it, but basically, you want to unit test your stuff because your users are not going to like doing it. So. We all like exceed. Some things, you need to um, choose what your unit test. You have a lot of code, you can end up writing um, too many tests. You spend all your time doing that and then the project runs late. Um, yep. So ideally you want to get the best bang for your buck when you're writing a unit test. So you want to work out which piece of the code you're testing. Um, if you, like I said, if you cover everything, it becomes high maintenance because it's a good idea to put your unit tests in the code. But of course, every time you change the code, your unit tests may need to change to stay up to date with it. So you want to focus on the riskiest parts of your code to test. Uh, complex algorithms, core modules, they're the best parts usually. It depends on what you're writing. Of course, it won't, test, won't fix requirement defects doing unit testing. And this slide has come out backwards, so I'll just do that. The best where unit testing has helped me the most is um, algorithmic code and framework code, um, especially if you're running maths or any other sort of stuff. Basically, you can write a unit test. You can take math code written in another language and call that from the unit test where it's already been proven, and then you call your own code in the unit test and compare it. And if there's a difference, well, you're finding the bug straight away instead of having to run up the software that uses that math library step through at the debugger, try and work out what's going on, so it shortcuts you there. Um, people can do unit testing with GUIs, but I've never really tried it. Um, I mainly code uh, more low level stuff. So some lessons learned, a bit of experience. Um, I had a client and we had a lot of code that had been written in C, C++, but it was started over several years of experimentation. It ran quite well on four cores because it was multi-threaded and we thought we need to get this faster. We put it on an eight core machine. It didn't actually get any faster. So uh, it turned out we needed to move to GPUs to get the speed boost we wanted. However, I was given the job of having to rewrite all this code to run on a GPU. So that's a tricky business in itself, debugging GPU code, never mind all the rest of it. The good thing about this is the GPU code is callable from C, C++. So what ended up helping me there is I was able to actually call the old code, which had three years of testing, it was known to work, call all the methods that did all the core math stuff, then call all the new code from the GPU, use the test, unit test harness would compare the results and it showed up pretty quickly where I had introduced bugs in the refactored GPU code. Whereas if I'd gone away, written the GPU separately, done the usual test cycle, found all the bugs, it would have probably taken me three times as long. So if you take one thing away from this talk, if you've got a refactored code and it's, say, mathematically intensive and unit testing can save you a lot of time. So moving on to Boost. Um, that's what we're here for. It's part of the Boost C++ library, which is a um, I, I call it an agglomeration because it's kind of built from all sorts of different C++ libraries of this framework. I'm specifically talking about just the boost part, boost test part of it today. It comes under the, uh, is an open source license, the boost license. It's um, more a BSD style one, so you can use it for open source and for um, commercial use. Boost test, or it's a C++ library. However, if you're cutting C code, you can still use it for that because we just call the C code from C++, wrap it in the usual 
if dev headers, if you're doing C library stuff. There may be some issues with using it in C. Probably just check the best, check best to check the online docs. Installation, um, I use it on Debian, so it's just their app get pretty simple. It's cross-platform, people use it on Windows. I guess you have to check out the docs for your own distribution. So just a quick hello world. Um, in this case, I've got a library called My Library, so I've written an API that has a bunch of functions or a class with a bunch of methods that I include that at the top. All you do is you define a library, include the boost unit test headers, and then I have a suite, and I'll go into some of these definitions in a minute. And I have a bunch of test cases. This particular example has just got one test case. I've called it the hello test case. One thing you can do with boost is you can say, well, I've got certain prerequisites. If they're not met, I can't even run the test. So in this case, I've got an imaginary environment where I have to make sure my integers are four bytes. Um, it's a bit Mickey Mouse. Having got past that, well, I run my test.class, which is coming from my library. I then check the result is what's expected for that API call. Obviously, in the real world, this would be a lot more complicated. You'd you know, change the input, do something. Maybe you'd run it through a for loop with a range of different inputs. It all depends on what you're trying to test, of course. But it all comes down to you call a piece of code, you check the result, and Boost does all the magic of giving you a, a log Um, boost can be fully inline, which can be really handy. So, or you can use the inline version. Um, it takes longer to compile, but depending on what you're coding, it might be useful not having to worry about linking library versions. It's all documented on the web page. Talking about um, compiling, I really like this one. So some features of Boost, um, we've got suites, fixtures, result checking, output control, and it's got an optional main. You might have noticed there was no main in that example. Suites are just a way of grouping tests. Um, just pretty much have one suite that covers the whole API I'm testing. It depends on what you're doing. If you have a large project with a large amount of unit tests, you might have multiple suites. The fixture I find a lot more useful. Um, if you've done any Java testing, you'll find it's got similar ideas. Um, often if you're testing a library, you might have to set up, call some init functions, and then you want to shut it down. And you want to make sure between each test you run that you kind of go back to a clean slate. So a fixture lets you go back to the clean slate, free resources, um, and boost when it runs the test, make sure that happens. So. In this case, I'm leveraging the fact that C++ has a class with a constructor where I initialize my library in a destructor, which automatically gets called when it goes out of scope to clean up. Under the hood, when boost runs your fixture test case, it automatically calls all those for you. Um, you don't have to sit there and create all magic objects yourself to deal with setting up resources, opening files, or whatever else needs to be done for your particular library. So. Running a test, um, you call the code, you check the outputs, rinse and repeat, you know, like all software testing. Boost just gives you a way of doing that for C++ that's predictable. Um, so what one thing, the main thing you're doing is checking your results. And there's a whole swag of different macros that let you check the results. You can check whether something is true, whether it's less than or equals. You can run two methods and compare it. Uh, again. This is an introduction, so I'll let you check the doco if you that. One thing I found when I first learned all this is it wasn't obvious the way the document structured is where all these macros were, and they're buried under something called testing tools reference near the end. So um, just something to bear in mind. When you run the test macros, there's a couple of different levels of control. The check is the normal one. That gives you like a pass slash fail output. So when you run a test and you have six boost checks, you might go pass, 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 fail, so you can Use the logging then to your advantage to see which bits. Warning, you might want to log a warning without actually failing the test, depending on what you want to do. So it's flexible like that. <coughs> and require, as I mentioned before, will cause the test to fail and no future parts of the test to run because something's wrong with your environment or the compiler hasn't linked the right library or something. Boost gives you good, con good control over your output. Um, you can have nothing but a bunch of, you might only want to see the fail messages because you might want to call your test scripts from some sort of nightly build system and have it email you just the fails. 
you might want to see the complete detailed log, of course, if you're trying to debug the testing program, you want to see everything. So it's got good control over how the logging works. So where was your main? It's hidden under the boost macros. You can use your own main if you need to, so it's flexible like that. But in this case, my, my, my test will usually be a CPP file, a bit structured like the example I showed before, but with a whole bunch of test cases. You may want to put one test case per CPP file or a suite or a group. It's up to whatever is best suited for your particular project. Of course, unit testing won't find all your bugs. So as an aside, I still use source code inspection for selected code and automatic tools. But unit testing will often find stuff that people miss. So in summary, all software has bugs. You don't want to be up at 3 a.m. So if you're doing C coding, fix your bugs and avoid sleepless nights and any unit testing framework. But Boost is easy to use. So. Right. Are there any questions? Yes. And it's always at the back, so more exercise for me. Can the boost libraries do a uh, tap test anything protocol? I don't know. I'm not aware of that one. Yeah, um, it's it's like goes it OK, not OK for each line. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I see what you mean. Um, you mean control of the output? Like you can go pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, pass. I don't know, it's just its own logging, but you can write your own logging handlers and stuff to customise the output. So if there's a protocol, I guess you'd do that. Any more questions? On the other aisle. Get more exercise on this day than I do on any day of the conference. Um, how do you write good test cases for mathematical software? Do you use random number generators and how would that work? Uh, it kind of depends on your algorithm. Um, in my case, we've often got code written in MATLAB. So one thing, and, and or we've got a previous version, because a lot of my work's been refactoring code written in C or MATLAB into running on a GPU. So I can call an older version that works and then call a new one and compare them. But I guess if you're doing a Greenfields algorithm, um, Often there's a long way to do something and then there's your API which might be optimised and I guess you can compare that and you probably don't want to brute force it but you can have like four loops doing um, a bunch of different inputs and I know you can do statistical stuff which I think is what you're getting at so you could probably, um, I'm no expert in any of this but I know of people that do, uh, they're experts in doing the statistics of testing sampling, so they can probably write sample the right stuff to test it. But um, in my experience, I've mainly been coding from an old piece of software to a new piece of software, and not having done a lot of new algorithmic stuff to have to do that. Often, though, you've got a fair idea of what the output should be. So often, you're just testing the um, the constraints. So you, for example, you know your algorithm can never output something that's less than zero. Well, that's one of the things you test. You run it for a bunch of typical numbers and make sure it never returns a zero in a loop. Um, it's, I guess, pretty specific on the problem you're trying to solve. Any more questions for Andrew? Well, there being no more questions, uh, please thank Andrew for his talk.